This is a Woodside Church Sunday. Welcome to Woodside Online, everybody. If I haven't met you before, my name's Anna and I get the pleasure of leading you through our service today. So first of all, we are going to have a time of worship and then we will listen to the preach that was recorded last Sunday. So that's it from me for now. Over to the worship team. Worthy of every song we could ever sing 
Thank you. Thank you. Well, as, as has been introduced, my name's Martin. It's wonderful to have an opportunity to share with you this morning. Uh, we've been away. Did you know we've been away for a few weeks? Someone said to me this morning, are you back already? <laughs> it's great to... My, Dawn and I... Dawn is here. Wave, Dawn. There you go. There you go. Hey, Dawn and I <laughs> have been off for a few weeks. Just allow you to settle down for a moment. You just like chatting to everyone, don't you? <laughs> That's good. Dawn and I have been away on sabbatical, uh, and we're very grateful that uh, we were allowed time to step away from the day-to-day aspects of, of uh, what I do here, and it's given us a chance to focus on some other things. Uh, I've got to tell you, we come back very energised, uh, very refreshed in God. Uh, very excited by uh, what the future holds and very encouraged by all of those things as well. So we come back in a good place, uh, which you'll be pleased to know. Uh, You'll probably think, thank goodness for that, you know. Uh, uh, We've met some amazing people, uh, amazing leaders we've had a chance, a privilege to meet. Uh, We've been to some some great churches. Uh, We've had some real fun. uh, And uh, we've had some surprises as well. Uh, One of the surprises was when we arrived in a place called St. Louis, which is in the States, and we were going to meet a team there for one of the New Frontiers uh, uh, apostolic teams, and we were going to spend some time with them. And uh, as we arrived, uh, we went into our Airbnb, uh, and we were going to be seeing someone in the evening, or a couple in the evening, so, so I decided to take a nap. No, no, so I decided to take a power nap. <laughs> and, uh, and so, I mean, Dawn pushed through, obviously. Uh, and so I was just dozing, and, and, and suddenly there was this alarm. I mean, a really loud alarm. I woke up, both of us looked at each other, and we're looking around for smoke alarms and fire alarms and any other sort of alarm. We couldn't find anything. And suddenly we realised our phones, both of them had alarmed together. What on earth's going on? And we looked at our screens, it said, tornado alert. <laughs> Seriously. And, and so I read down and it's, it said, go into a basement, follow the media, or hide in a bathroom or an internal room. I'm thinking, oh my goodness. So I'd woken up by then. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and so we, we contacted the person, or I text the person who had organised the Airbnb, and uh, obviously I, my text was calm collected and, and uh, we just wondered what this might mean and this lady responded actually you're right you haven't got a basement you probably need to get into the bathroom so I went in went inside to find Dawn running the bath <laughs> so, that's, sorry, that's not true that's not true sorry sorry that was just my silly joke really uh, and so uh, and so we, we put the TV on and we looked outside it was you know, wickedly dark, if you like. And so it was really amazing what was going on. Follow it on the TV. Now, if you've ever been in the States, you know, there, there's a weather channel, which all it tells you is weather all day. I love it. I can sit there and watch all the, these things. And suddenly, they go on the weather channel, and you see the guy in St. Louis, and his umbrella is blown out, and he's going, I'm in St. Louis, and it's raining, and all this business. And, and it was all quite 
exciting, uh, although terrifying at the same time. And so, and then they went back to the anchor, and I thought, what's going on? And then suddenly the anchor said, we've got touchdown, we've got touchdown, which meant the tornado had touched down in St. Louis. So they went back to St. Louis, and I said to Dawn, we've got touchdown, we've got touchdown. It was quite funny. Uh, and, uh, I mean, obviously, we made it. <laughs> And 15 minutes later, it had all passed by. And uh, I got a text from uh, the guy that uh, we were seeing a lot of, and he just said, welcome to St. Louis, with a, <laughs> with, with a tornado e e emoji. You know? And then we saw the couple that evening, and we said, did you catch the news? And they looked at me and they said, that happens all the time. And they, obviously, they ignore it. So we've, we've, had, we've had some fun. Uh, and some surprises. Uh, we've missed you. I mean, when we came back, uh, one person said to me, to be honest, don't take this the wrong way, Martin, but we haven't missed you at all. <laughs> OK, uh, OK. Uh, someone else said, said, are you back already? You should go away a bit longer, I think. <laughs> and I'm thinking, I'm reading between the lines here. <laughs> Joking aside, uh, we, we've had a great time, but we're thrilled to get back. We actually came back a week earlier. We couldn't, we couldn't resist. Two weeks ago, we came back, and we're amazing Sunday morning, as today is as well. And um, there's moments as a leader when you have a greater awareness, if you like, a sober assessment of how much God needs you. It's good. It's good for you. And you realize, actually, Jesus is actually pretty good. That's an English understatement. Pretty good at building his church. It's wonderful to feel the presence of God this morning and to see leaders leading us and with me now to do with it. And you think, yes, Jesus is building his church. It's great, isn't it? And so actually us going away has, has been great for creating space and to see all that God wants to do amongst us. While we were away, these verses in Ephesians came to mind. Paul wrote this, Ever since I heard your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. And we feel like that, the sense of giving thanks for your faith and what God is doing amongst the Woodside family is, is a complete thrill. But I've got some stuff I'd like to share. Uh, maybe we can put the first slide on, Matt. Thank you. Uh, that's the Woodside bus. We haven't purchased a bus, but that's the, that's the Woodside bus. I thought this morning what I'd like to do is, I know that's going to Woodside, which actually is the bus stop outside. That's the only place that's Woodside now uh, in this area. Uh, but I, well, I, I'm rather looking at this is, the, this is us as a people, and obviously the guys from Great Denham as well, and our journey together. And I'd like to talk about that. Now, what I don't want to do today is talk about vision and destination and where we're heading and strategy and all those sorts of things. I don't want to talk about any of that stuff. I rather want to talk about the bus itself, us, ourselves, and maybe ask questions like, well, what's under the bonnet of the Woodside bus? What are the brakes like? What's the the tread like on the tires. It's more of a how are we doing as a people rather than where we're going together. And when I've been away, that's some of the things that God has highlighted, not particularly for us specifically, but more generally about his church. But I think those things apply to us today. So it's really about are we in good work in order? Are we ready, that, ready to navigate the bumps in the road ahead, which I'm sure there will be. And of course, our response today is both corporate, us together, but also personally. We are a group of individuals. And so it's how we respond to these personally as well as corporately. So I have, goodness, seven. Seven things that I'd like to share. Is that all right? Is that all right, Colin? You see, if I was clever, I'd planned that. Good job, God is. I told you God was uh, doing great. Okay, number one. Now, this one has already happened in our worship. Number one, we are not in control, but we know 
we know who is. We are not in control, but we know who is. We are coming through, we hope and pray, one of the greatest natural disasters in history. Quickly move on, but the last few years have been brutal. Uh, We are also entering such uncertainty now uh, with war in Europe, mental health, Uh, impacting so many, cost of living crisis. I'm not trying to give you all the bad news, but I think we've got to be real about the circumstances we find ourselves in. We are in challenging days. The road is bumpy. The result can be, so often, a deep sense of a loss of control. So what on earth is going on around us? It's so important in these challenging times that we find our bearings and our remedy, I think, to ensuring that we know who is in control is to double down on surrendering to God. To know that actually he is the the one who's in control. To dig deeper in that rather than pull back from that. There's a wonderful story in the early church in Acts 4, which I want to read to you, where the, the early church were seeing remarkable fruit. God was so with them, but also they were beginning to get genuine opposition against them. Is this, is this booming a bit? Just me. It's all right? Okay. Uh, genuine opposition. The, the two of the leaders have been brought up against the authorities. They'd be told never to speak about, about Jesus again. And we pick up in Acts 4 uh, how they respond to this moment. Let me, let me read to you this. It's one of my favourite stories of the early church. Uh, I haven't got on the screen, apologies for that, but if you want to follow it, it's in Acts 4, 24. They said this, Sovereign Lord. Sovereign Lord. It's a prayer they begin. Of course, sovereign means you're in control. That's what sovereignty means. It's about control, isn't it? Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. And they quote Old Testament scriptures. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. They're expressing that now they're feeling opposition. But you're sovereign, Lord. You're in control. We don't feel in control, but you're in control. You can feel this tension in this prayer. And then they give the best example I can find of when it looked like God was not in control, but actually we discover that he was in control all the time after all. Verse 27, Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in the city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will decided beforehand should happen. See, God decided beforehand what should happen. Evil men conspired. It looked like things were out of control. The greatest example of that is when Jesus went to the cross, but it was part of God's plan after all. We need to double down, like we did as we worship this morning in surrendering to God. And so whatever life brings, we can trust that the word of God tells us that God is in control. God is in control. Alongside that is giving up the right to know why something has happened or why something is happening. Philippians 4 says this, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, Present your request to God and the peace of God which transcends all understanding. That means that you don't know why. Something happens, but actually the peace of God comes that goes beyond understanding. And this will guard our hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. We double down, as you could say, in trusting that God is sovereign And that, yes, we're not in control, but our Lord is in control. That's the first one. Oh, no, there's one more bit to say. Sorry. 
See, as believers, we've been given an amazing gift that we can know that God's in control even when we don't feel like we're in control. Something that those who don't know God do not know. I was talking to one leader, a guy called John Tyson, he's an amazing church in New York, and I said to him, how do you feel about the future with everything going on in the world, in his city, and in the lives of people around us? How do you feel about the future? He said, I'm optimistic. I said, okay. <laughs> I wasn't quite expecting that. He said, I'm optimistic. I said, why? He said, the Western world has never had the answers. Now it knows it. Think about it. For decades, as a Western society, and I've been critical of us, but as a Western society, we thought that that disease and illness, we had some sense of control over that. The economy, economy was, was essentially going in the general right direction. There's a debate on that, I realise. But suddenly, it feels like all those things have been turned upside down. The Western world thought it had all those things under control. Now it realised it doesn't. So we're optimistic because we know that God is in control. Amen. Number two, we've been assigned one mission, and that's to make disciples. One mission. Yes, to love God, love one another, but our purpose, our mission is to go and make disciples. Wherever I went, everyone's talking about discipleship. Every church, every leader, it's like one of the themes that's coming through. And if I'm honest, it's something that I think as leaders we all feel quite challenged by about how well we've done at growing disciples. So this is a church perspective rather than just drilling down on ourselves. But it's a clear mission from Jesus. A guy called Steve Nicholson, who is one, or was, just retired actually, one of the senior leaders of the Vineyard family based in Chicago, he said this, and this was really uh, surprising, if not shocking to hear. Steve Nicholson, uh, well-respected leader, he said this, in 1974, which is when the Vineyard churches started, we thought if we made churches more culturally relevant, the church will grow. With contemporary music, come as you are approach, great welcome, etc., We did this, and this made a lot of big churches. There's now churches of thousands in the States and in the UK, which there never were before. Then he said this, but we rarely talked about self-sacrifice, laying down your life, dying to self. And when the crunch came, many were not prepared. The attractional model of church led to a lack of discipleships of disciples, sorry. The attractional model is a phrase that basically means uh, amazing musicians, amazing worship, amazing teaching, uh, almost putting on a show, where he was honestly saying, that's great, but how is it done in training and equipping and raising disciples? When we came back from Lockdown, we talked about a reboot. That was underneath what we were feeling. But actually, hang on a minute. Have we, have we inadvertently slipped, drifted away from what we read in the New Testament, this vibrant body? Now, you come on a Sunday morning now, you see a vibrant body. So please don't hear what I'm not saying. But it's helpful just to get a perspective of what God seems to be saying to the church. Because if I'm honest, and I've had to repent for this, I've been tempted and in some respects have lent into, at times in my ministry, more of an attractional model that's described here. But then you realize, hang on, how good is that at actually training and releasing disciples? So this point is as much for me as it is for anyone else. You might be sitting there thinking, yeah, this is you, Martin. But it's helpful for us to understand. That's why we are so uh, focused here on community groups and the life that's in a community group, a small group that meets during the week, maybe uh, weekly or every other week. Because we know this this is the life that's described in the Bible will never be reproduced at a gathering like this. We need gatherings like this because we're part of a wider family. We need to be this one new person together. But actually, we also need the community life that we see expressed in a smaller context. We've always had a focus on that, and I think 
one of the reasons why so many of us have come through the pandemic thinking, oh, I still know Jesus, he, I still know he loves me and I love God's family, is because we've put an emphasis on that. And we continue to do that now. We have a cycle here in our small groups where once a year they all close. It doesn't sound like we put an emphasis on it, does it? Once a year they all close in order to restart again in September, October. And so we're just about to enter that. Gives a chance for new leaders to emerge. Gives a chance for some leaders to say, okay, I want to pause now. Gives a chance for people to move to different groups if they want to. And so we're just about to get to that place. And, uh, and so just want to make you aware. If you're fairly new to Woodside, please get into a group. It's the way you can really express the New Testament Christianity. It's the way that we can serve you the, the best in terms of training you and supporting you to be a disciple of Jesus. That community life is such an important part of that. Thirdly, we need to understand that our identity includes community with others. We need to understand that our identity includes community with others. This is linked to the one before, of course. I just want to mention, there's been a lot of focus and teaching and emphasis on the importance of our identity in Christ, as there should be. The fact that we know God is our Father and we're his child. I mean, that's foundational for us as believers. But sometimes what can happen is the emphasis in our culture of individualism means that our understanding of identity is pigeonholed or focused on being an individual believer rather than being part of a community. Do you understand? So individualism is like it has a stronghold on our culture. Yeah? I mean, that means if something has a stronghold, wait for it, that means that it has a strong hold over you. Okay? So culturally, individualism has a strong hold over us. So we need to make sure, hang on a minute, are we, are we teaching truth but applying it into a context which is a cultural context. So individualism would be one of those. Other things, um, consumerism would be another one, you know. All the isms, maybe, I don't know, maybe not. And so one of these guys I met, Steve Nicholson, he said, when you teach on, ind- on identity, you need to do it in this order. Relationship with God, first. Secondly, community with others. And thirdly, who I am. As a, as a child of God, if you like. And I found that so helpful. I thought, how often do we talk about identity being connected to community? I thought, is that biblical? You bet your life it is. Uh, Romans 12. Let me read Romans 12, verse 5 to you. It says this. I love this. So in Christ... We are many, so in Christ, we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Then it goes on to we have different gifts. So in Christ, we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. There's this identity, this belonging to one another that sometimes I think can get missed. Sometimes people talk about, well, I've got you know, my personal walk with God. And somehow church and community is, is, isn't, isn't seen as part of that identity. It's not how the Bible describes it. We're those who belong to one another. Now, of course, the fact that you're here means that you get this. I realize that. But it's helpful to understand why that's so important. Even when I've spoken to someone this morning, I won't embarrass them. But they said to me, I said that Dawn and I came back a week early. She said, I know, it's about community, isn't it? I said, you're absolutely right. It's about being part of a community. This is something, if you're white English, this is harder for us to understand. It seems to be that that some of my African friends and my Asian friends, they understand better about what it means to be part of a community and identity within a community. Is that right? Some people are not in. Uh, and so, so I, think, I think we, maybe, some of us, certainly me, maybe need to learn on this. But it's a wonderful truth, isn't it? And we know what it feels like when we know it. Number four, we need to allow the Bible to do its work. 
I mean, some of this is not going to be great revelation for you this morning. If you came thinking, I'm going to get something new, I went away for a few weeks and found out the old stuff is the best stuff, okay? So some of what's happening around the world is people saying, how well do we know our Bibles? Honestly, how well do we know them? When, when lockdown hit, I felt God say to me, not harshly, but very clearly, now we see what sort of church you've built. Now, I discovered that I never built the church anyway. That's been part of my journey. One of the things that's been really exciting is people discovering uh, a very simple way of reading the Bible. And that's taking a few verses or a chapter or a story and just asking a few simple questions. What does this tell you about God? What does this tell you about people? What should I do in light of this? And who might I tell? Four simple questions. If you read a section of the Bible, ask those four questions. Maybe with, a, with someone else. Maybe even in our community groups we may do, do that in some of the groups. What does this tell you about God? What does this, these, this, these verses tell you about people? What do I now do about it? Jesus said, teach them to obey. And who might I tell? Who am I going to share this with? It's really helpful. I've done this. I know some folks here are doing that at the moment. Getting into the word. Number five, prayer is the fuel. Prayer is the fuel. We meet tonight. Seven o'clock? Seven o'clock. I'd love you to come and join us. It's very informal. It's only an hour. We don't worship to begin with, not normally. We gather, we pray. We don't have a long agenda. In fact, we don't have an agenda. We just, the agenda is whatever each of us bring. If you can join us, we'd love you to come and be a part of that. Number six, I'll keep going because of time. Number six, more sailing, less rowing. It's my favourite one, I think, at the moment. More sailing, less rowing. If you're aware, the Holy Spirit, the best way to understand the Holy Spirit, being filled with the Holy Spirit, the word for the Holy Spirit is ruach, and ruach means, it means breath or wind of God. And to be filled with the Holy Spirit isn't, like many of us have heard and I've done, is a filling of a glass of water. That isn't an isn't a accurate way, really, to describe the filling of the Holy Spirit. The filling of the Holy Spirit is like a sail on a boat. It's funny, all the references to seas and sails here. A sail on a boat, when the wind of the Spirit blows, it fills that sail, and you get pulled along by the Spirit in a particular direction. That's being filled with the Holy Spirit. It's not a tingly feeling. Although it can be. Yeah? It's about being fully taken along with God's plan for you and I. That's what it means. And if I'm honest, I've done too much rowing and not enough sailing in my life. How about you? Sometimes I've been rowing and I feel like I'm rowing against the tide, but I'm sure this is the right thing to do. I'm going to keep doing it. And there's some fruit, a bit of encouragement, first fruits maybe, and you keep going. And then you say, hang on a minute. Jesus said, I only do what I see the Father doing. In other parts of the New Testament, it says, keep in step with the Spirit. There's, there's consistent messages throughout the Bible. It's, we follow God. We don't have columns of fire, and, but we have the wind of the Spirit blowing ourselves. Amen? Yeah. I encourage us to do that personally, but corporately too. I mean, let's be honest, we're not interested in what I think. Amen? Amen? It's true, I'm not interested in what I think. I want to know what God wants for Woodside. He knows. Amen. You, look, you all seem too excited about that point, I'm just saying, okay. Okay, number seven, and finally, this is one thing that God said so clearly, invest in the next generations and create a legacy. Now, interestingly, when I, uh, when I, was going on sabbatical, I felt God reminded me of my age. That's a little harsh, but, but I'm 58 this year. I know, you can't believe it, can you? Uh, I'm 58 this year, which means in 10 years' time, I will be 68. See, it's clever. Uh, but I thought, maybe I've got about another 10 years to go. Yeah, maybe. 
God willing, if you have me around, or maybe longer, maybe short, shorter, who knows. But I realized that actually the next season for me is about legacy. It's about ensuring that I use all of what God's put in me, not a lot, but I do to my greatest effort to ensure that what comes doesn't finish at the end of my story, but actually is propelled into the next generation. Amen? But then I thought, actually, this isn't just about me. This church is coming to the end of a generation. When did we start? 40, 50 years ago or something? As many of us, many of you have been around a long time. There's a people. There's something about us doing the right things. I'm not saying we haven't been doing the right things, but making sure in the next so many years that we are investing in a way that means Woodside's glory days are not this 40, 50 year generation. And let's be honest, God's done some great things amongst us. I can say that because I've only been here the last 10 years. So it's, not, it's not a lot to do with whatever I've got. Do you understand? But boy, I'm praying for glory days, if that's the right way to put it, that go beyond to the next generation, the next generation. It's about legacy. And of course, if we're talking legacy, it's about investing in the next generations. Psalm 71. I felt God speak to me on this, just to ground it in scripture. Uh, it says this, Now that I am old and grey, Again, a little harsh, I thought. But certainly thin, certainly thin. Do not abandon me, O oh God. Let me proclaim your power to this new generation, your mighty miracles to all who come after me. This is a, the writer is someone who's still running with God. This isn't saying it's all about the youngsters. No, this is saying, do not abandon me, God. Stay with me, God. Be faithful with me, God. Why? Because I want to pass this on to the next generations. So it's not just, oh, suddenly it's all about the young people. No, no, no. It is, but it's not. They need you and me pushing ahead with God, saying, I can't keep up. Come on, you can come with us. We have got history in God that we need to impart to our sons and daughters. Did you hear me? COVID has been brutal. The COVID years have been brutal for the younger generations. There's many reasons why. There are challenges that the millennials and the Gen Zs are facing, which people like me and older never faced. The internet world, never knowing not having a smartphone that engages with the internet. That's a, that's a very different world to the world that I grew up in. The problem with anxiety and mental health, it's, it's massive. We've really got to help these generations coming through and serve them, invest in them, do all that we can. And I think the things that we need to do now are probably different to what we did for the previous generations. It's so different. I've read a lot about Gen Zs and Millennials. So I'm, I'm, all, I'm full of it, as you can tell. I'm, I'm, and more energy is coming, isn't it? It's funny, isn't it? I really feel this strongly. But I'm very excited about the future. I really am. I'm optimistic. Because the West doesn't have the answers. But my God does. Amen. Let's stand together, shall we? Let's stand. If you want to go home with anything, I've got four of the seven for you to go home with. The Bible, prayer, the Holy Spirit, and the church community. If a believer holds on to those like the four wheels of a bus with Woodside on the front, they won't go far wrong. The Bible, the Holy Spirit, prayer, and the church family. There you go. The Christian life is simple. If we do all those things well, we won't go far wrong. Lord God, we thank you that you are the King. You are Saviour and our Lord. We thank you that you have caught us up in your purposes. We thank you that we're saved by grace. We thank you that whatever we face, whatever stormy seas we face, we don't face them alone. Lord, we know that we're not in control, but we know who is. We thank you, God, that you're sovereign and you never leave us or forsake us. We pray, I pray for anyone that, was, uh, re that it resonated with during our worship about those stormy seas. Lord, I pray you comfort them, bring peace to them, and God, I pray you intervene in their circumstance because you're in control. The circumstance isn't in control. 
Jesus, you have the last word. And Lord, I pray that we would be a people of the word and a people of the spirit. Spirit of God, I pray you blow your wind upon us and help us to put those sails up and catch your wind and follow your purposes. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So that is it. Thank you so much for joining us, everyone. I hope you've been blessed by what you've heard here today. If you're new to Woodside and you want to find out more about who we are, what we do, what we believe, then please feel free to check out the link that is on the screen now. And if you would like to get in contact with us, then please also feel free to email the address that's on screen and one of our team will get back to you. We'd love to have you join us in person one week. We meet at 10 o'clock every Sunday morning and you can join us either over in Great Denham or at our building on Dover Crescent in Putnam. So that is it. I hope you all have a wonderful week and I will see you soon. Thanks for joining us. For more information, visit woodsidechurch.com or follow us on social media.